So, um, how economy, uh, the economy affects the real estate market? Um, it doesn't look particularly promising if we look at the headlines. Um, I mean, we had Brexit here, you can tell me about it later, but also uh, news for me closer to home uh, in terms of uh, the German market. Um, there, there was actually news early this week about Germany possibly heading into a technical recession uh, in, in September. Um, but also more geopolitically, uh, the trade wars, um, things like that, everything points towards a, a slowdown in the, in the economy. Headlines are really nice for, for clickbait, but let's look at what we are really looking at uh, in terms of uh, the macro picture. The white bars here show the um, forecast economic growth for 2019, and uh, the sort of purple lines on top of that show the five-year average growth. Um, and what we actually see are a number of things. Um, firstly, we see that in all the markets we do see indeed lower growth than uh, the five-year average. But I w wanted to point out, we talked about uh, Germany just now, Italy and Sweden. And indeed Germany, the economy is, uh, is, is slowing down a bit, which is mostly affected by lower uh, manufacturing. And Germany is in fact one of the uh, largest trading partners for the Netherlands. So that's really something to keep an eye on. Uh, at the same time, we do see that the Netherlands is relatively resilient, at least so far, with pretty, pretty good numbers, just below 2% for 2019. Um, but I think the most, two Im most important ones are actually China and, and the US here. Um, China is seeing a bit of a slowdown in growth, but still growth numbers are pretty good. And actually, that is what re will really affect the global economy. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's not that bad as you would think if you just look at the headlines sometimes. That's about the, the real economy. Then there's also something like the European Central Bank. And I'm always impressed to see the, the balance sheet of the ECB and how it's expanded when they first started QE. You see the different uh, purchase programs, uh, but it's more that you see the, the build up through this net purchase phase up until yeah, December 2018. Then finally it got quiet um, for a couple of months, but now uh, the ECB is again uh, kickstarting QE, a new purchase package um, uh, recently announced and um, there's no end date in sight. So yeah, again, a lot of um, monetary easing that we're looking at, which will in turn also affect, uh, we just talked about it with some of my fellow panelists, um, affect the interest rate environment going forward. So it, it will likely be, um, putting more pressure on the investment market um, in, in Europe and the Netherlands. Yeah, actually we just have the numbers in for Q3. Um, so these are investment volumes um, historically for uh, the first three quarters of the year. We can see is actually volumes are still at elevated levels if you compare it to 2007, we're roughly uh, around the same, same level there. We do see a slight slowdown compared to record year 2018. Um, both in continental Europe, but particularly in the UK. And that's not a big surprise. Actually, I was hopeful that maybe Q3 would look a bit better. Um, but we see that volumes are around the level of 2013, 2012-ish. Um, so there's still a lot of uncertainty in the market, and that has definitely affected investment volumes. But hopefully Q4 uh, will look a bit uh, better if there's more uh, clarity around the direction of travel. In general, the key takeaway here is uh, volumes are uh, a bit slower than, uh, than last year, but still uh, look good across the board and uh, there's a lot of liquidity in the market. So looking at the top five markets in Europe at the moment, um, here we see actually the rolling four quarters, um, so 2018 on the far right hand side and uh, 2019. Here, the uh, main conclusion here is actually that uh, in all the major markets we see sl slower, uh, lower volumes than last year, except for France, which may be not that big of a surprise as well, because France was lagging the other markets a bit, both in terms of the economy and uh, investment market. So, so that's actually a positive sign. And also, uh, we're talking about the Netherlands, so uh, it's interesting to point out that the Netherlands has fortified its position um, as the fourth largest investment market in, in Europe, which is quite remarkable given it's such a small country. And also if I would show this chart or this table um, weighted by, uh, by capita, on a by capita basis, uh, the Netherlands would clearly be on top here. So a very liquid market, um, and let's see what type of sectors are uh, invested in. 
So this is again at the first three quarters uh, historically, but just for the Netherlands. And uh, here you can see the different sectors. Um, hopefully you can all read it. Um, what we can uh, see is that the market has become much more diversified than if we compare it to 2007. Uh, a wide variety of different sectors. And especially residential stands out um, here, the, the orange uh, bar. And uh, that market has opened up uh, from 2014 onwards when there was a lot of international capital looking at the uh, Dutch uh, residential market and that continued. Um, and at present it's uh, about a six billion um, investment market for um, if you look on an annual basis, which makes it the second largest residential investment market in Europe after Germany. A couple of other things that we can talk about, uh, the investor basis is really uh, diversified in terms of nationalities. Again, that's a difference uh, when we compare it to 2007, for instance. Um, back then, the market was dominated by domestic players, about 60% would be do uh, domestic and 30-40% uh, uh, um, international capital. Now it's just the other way around, a lot of international capital from yeah, basically all over the world. Um, in terms of pricing, I have the feeling that um, we always have discussions that most yield compression is already behind us. But in fact, if we look back one year, we still see that there's uh, even more yield compression in, in a number of markets. Um, the four um, markets with, or the two markets with most yield compression are Madrid and, uh, and Amsterdam, in fact. But also in Germany, we still see more yield compression. And in this, this particular um, bar chart refers to Munich, but also we see yield compression to continue in, the, in Frankfurt and the, the other uh, top markets in Germany. But yeah, pricing for Amsterdam, uh, it's, it's getting more and more uh, expensive. It's now around uh, 3% on a net initial basis. That's just prime offices, uh, because that's a good proxy and uh, um, good to compare internationally. But here we can look at all the different uh, asset classes, so we already talked about offices. Or maybe sec secondary uh, office markets, those are more the um, um, markets, if you're familiar with Amsterdam, like Southeast Arena, which is really, it's, it's not the prime CBD, but also uh, a rapidly improving sub-market. And um, yeah, we see a lot of yield compression there, and actually I think that the gap with prime and secondary will narrow going forward. Residential, it's, it's pretty stable. There's a lot of demand for resi as we've seen, but we don't really see uh, that having an impact on pricing. We, we still see capital value growth, but it's more uh, because of the rental um, uh, increase in the rental uh, values. Industrial yeah, logistics is it's one of the most mature uh, logistics markets uh, in, in Europe. Um, and definitely in light industrial, those are the type of buildings where you would see small, medium-sized enterprises uh, in the adjacent areas of the city. And you really see that a lot of um, uh, investor focus is um, going after those uh, type of uh, properties. Um, retail, that's, uh, that's a different story. Even in Prime High Street, which refers to Amsterdam um, highest footfall locations, we see a bit of a correction because of investor sentiment. There are simply fewer investors looking at that type of product, so that also has an, uh, an impact on pricing. Uh, but definitely in the secondary retail um, locations, secondary high streets, I don't think that's unique for the Dutch market, but still we also see it there. Then the, the sector overview. I'm not sure if there are any people in the room that still have a, a negative connotation when we talk about Dutch office market. Um, but um, yeah, it uh, used to be um, around the turn of the century there was a, bit, a lot of oversupply in the market. But the market has, has changed um, dramatically over the last two decades. Um, here we can see the vacancy rate um, and um, historically since 2010. First of all, we can see is uh, Amsterdam uh, is, is the leading market in terms of where we saw the steepest decline in, uh, in vacancy. Initially, it was driven by uh, a lot of conversions, taking obsolete office space out of the office stock to convert it to uh, residential, student housing and hotels. Uh, but later, I would say from 2015 onwards, it was all uh, taken over by um, more leasing activity and the office occupiers trying to expand their footprint. Utrecht in The Hague also sort of followed that pattern, less pronounced though. Uh, in Rotterdam you can clearly see uh, that there's now also this whole wave of uh, transformations going on. Uh, we see a lot of developments to residential, redevelopments to residential, particularly in the CBD area. And um, in, in general, markets are 
getting tighter and tighter. And especially if we look at the vacancy rates for the CBD areas, we see it's more pronounced. So uh, vacancy rates, uh, yeah, what's happened in Rotterdam is, uh, is particularly interesting. <coughs> this was in the global financial crisis when um, there was still um, M&A transaction of Fortis being acquired by ABN and then they consolidated their offices in another uh, city in, uh, in Amsterdam. Um, so it left a lot of uh, vacant office space in the CBD in Rotterdam and then there were a few others uh, uh, that um, also made similar decisions. So, And as you know the city is, is really, uh, it has a different structure than uh, the other cities in uh, the Netherlands. Um, whereas uh, Amsterdam, uh, Utrecht, Hague have a historic city center. Rotterdam is relatively new and a lot of office buildings were built uh, in the 60s and 70s of the uh, previous century. So um, it wasn't always suitable for like modern office occupiers. So there was a lot of uh, work to be done and actually that has been uh, done. So now the vacancy rate is around 5% uh, for Rotterdam and Hague and yeah, uh, around 2 percentage for Amsterdam and Utrecht, which is, yeah, extremely tight. Then, um, in terms of demand, what's really interesting to see is that uh, if we, here is a chart where uh, we see the growth in um, employment. Uh, so, <coughs> what's most important is growth in office-based employment, because those are people that work in offices uh, and will determine future demand. Uh, but what's a really growing sector is obviously tech-based employment, and um, if we look at the top four markets here, um, so Dublin, Berlin, Amsterdam and London, <coughs> those are also the markets that have seen steepest rental growth throughout the cycle. And in Amsterdam, for example, a lot of these tech firms really want to be in the city centre, and not just in the CBD, but really in the city centre to be offered to, uh, to attract talent from all over the world and offer them the, the Amsterdam vibe uh, with the, the canals and, uh, and that type of uh, atmosphere. So this is definitely a trend that is structural um, and uh, will uh, continue. So um, uh, that um, will result in more rental growth uh, for these uh, locations. Then logistics and retail, um, the two are increasingly intertwined. First of all, logistics, I briefly mentioned it, is one of the most mature logistics markets in, uh, in Europe because of the port of Rotterdam. And uh, we actually see that there's um, increasing development activity. This is, uh, this is for Europe, but uh, it also uh, applies to uh, the Netherlands. But still, we don't see that it has a negative effect on vacancy. Um, vacancy rates are actually uh, even lower in, in the Netherlands. So we still see vacancy rates going down despite the growing development pipeline. Although the type of uh, demand is really changing in the Netherlands. So, uh, initially, it was largely driven by, uh, by exports and trade, um, and now um, that's uh, not so much um, a driver. Um, but we rather see that it's, it's currently driven by uh, restructuring of supply chains as an effect of a growing e-commerce sector. And um, we uh, are working with Euromonitor to understand how that's going to develop going forward. And um, the UK is the most uh, developed markets in terms of um, uh, online retail sales. But we see that the Netherlands is catching up and catching up pretty quickly. In just five years we expect, or Euromotor expects, uh, that 21% uh, of all retail sales will be done online. Um, yeah, and what will be the impact on retail? We briefly touched on it. Um, we already see investor sentiment is affected by it. And we also see it in the high streets, but it's not necessarily Amsterdam that will be affected. I mean, um, those cities will see a lot of tourism, but it's more the regional cities like um, Zwolle, Eindhoven, uh, some um, cities that may sound less familiar to you, but um, those have more of a regional catchment area. Those are really affected by this trend and uh, see less football. Last market, um, residential, uh, already showed you that it's the largest investment market at present in, in the Netherlands. And I think we can explain the whole occupier fundamentals by just this chart. Um, what we see here is a very large owner occupier market. Uh, that's because um, there are some regulations uh, that uh, support home ownership. Um, it's, uh, I'm not going to make it very technical, but it's a very large market. Um, and, and then there's also the rental segment, but that's divided into the unregulated and the regulated uh, rental market. 
and uh, actually I see that the, the two are uh, switched. So this is the regulated rental market, which is social housing, and that's, uh, you can only apply for social housing if you either have no job or uh, don't make <coughs> enough money. Um, so that's kept at a um, rental price of 700 euros per month, um, and, and that's for your apartment. So that's a, that's a highly regulated area. And then there's this whole uh, very small private rental segment. And um, what you now actually see, because of all the price increases in the owner-occupier market, um, you see that new people that are uh, just graduated, they are sort of squeezed into this market segment, which is actually the smallest. Uh, just over 10%. They cannot afford to, to buy a house because the prices are uh, too high. Uh, at the same time, they do have a job, so they cannot apply for regulated, um, for social housing. Um, so they really need to pay up, and um, yeah, that's a, a really difficult situation. It's not unique to the Dutch market. There's a, a growing scrutiny um, on the uh, affordability of residential in a number of cities, actually also here in London, uh, but most notoriously, I guess, in, uh, in Berlin, where they just approved a, a rent freeze for five years. Um, and yeah, I'm not sure if the Netherlands will head in the same direction, but there's still a lot of um, uh, talk about what they need to do in order to um, put a stop to those price increases.